and this is going to be a, a double act in which we shift the focus uh, onto that half of the research community uh, that works in the humanities and the social sciences, not in STM, and onto books, uh, a book world that is at present very far from a wholly digital world. And I'm going to talk about the supply chain, the processes by which books get from authors to publishers and then uh, through two main routes uh, to readers. The two main routes are obviously through academic libraries on the one hand and through booksellers uh, whether they are bricks and mortar booksellers or online booksellers uh, on the other. The retail trade, if you like, as against uh, the library trade. And those two routes are very different, not least because in the one world, the, the route going to academic libraries and then to, to readers, print is becoming much less important than it was uh, even quite recently. There has been a significant shift towards uh, e-books, a strong library preference for e-books as distinct from print, and I'll talk about reasons for that in a moment. In the, the retail part of the, uh, of the trade, e-books play a much, much, much less significant role. Print remains dominant, uh, and that then has implications uh, for the way in which the supply chain works. And that is not least because, of course, both print and e uh, remain together critical for the uh, success, the financial success of individual books, individual titles, and their viability. So who are these intermediaries? A short list here of uh, metadata suppliers, sales agents, both within publishers uh, and third-party sales agents, wholesalers, distributors, library suppliers, the booksellers I've already mentioned, aggregators particularly for the, uh, the e-books. And of course, I could, that is a very simple categorization of the different kinds of intermediaries uh, involved. I could easily extend that list uh, by uh, the, the same number all over again. But I suppose one of the, the critical developments of recent years has been the involvement of several uh, kinds of intermediaries in the creation of digital warehouses uh, where they don't hold physical stocks of books, uh, they hold digital versions of books which can then be supplied through either route, through the e-book mainly e-book route to libraries uh, or the, the mainly print book route to, uh, to booksellers uh, from, the, from the, the digital files that they, they hold. And of course, that is what lies behind uh, the demise of lots of physical warehouses that used to be held by, uh, run by, um, uh, by publishers. And of course, I... I should at this point mention uh, the biggest bookseller in the world, Amazon, uh, who is dealing in all these intermediary areas and has had and continues to have a very profound effect on the ways in which the supply chain works overall. And if we think of this simply in terms of very crude and 
simple economics. We're living in a world where the supply of books, particularly monographs in the humanities and social sciences, is increasing at a very steady rate. Uh, the UK uh, publishing industry publishes almost twice as many monographs now as it did 10 or 15 years ago. It's not clear that the demand for those books, certainly at the per title level, has increased. Sales have tended over the last 10 years to be static at best. Uh, but of course, demand doesn't uh, exist solely in the form of sales. The library route uh, to readers is very important. And there are signs that e-demand uh, uh, through libraries uh, is, is quite buoyant overall, although at the individual title level, not necessarily so. I mean, there clearly is a constraint uh, if the uh, number of potential readers is not increasing uh, at the same rate that supply is increasing. There are constraints of simply the amount of time that individual readers have to, to, to devote to reading books. But my gold arrow here, of course, raises the question not about, not just about the effectiveness of a supply chain, but of a value chain. Is what's going on in the, the activities of those intermediaries dealing with marketing, distribution, sales, creation of metadata, and so on, is it fit for purpose in the modern world, or could it be made more effective uh, than it is at present? Let me focus for a moment just on one part of that supply perhaps value chain. Not so very long ago, it was the case that several of the intermediaries who I've mentioned were very heavily involved in the marketing of new titles as they came out. Some were even quite heavily involved in the marketing and promotion of backlist titles. That is no longer the case. New title marketing in particular is almost entirely now uh, the responsibility of publishers rather than of any of the intermediaries that I've, I've spoken of. The intermediaries from wholesalers to distributors to booksellers are much, much more concerned now with how effectively they can meet established demand, demand that they know already exists, rather than effective marketing to create new demand for titles. And in some ways, that is perhaps one of the most profound uh, impacts that Amazon has had, because of course Amazon does that extremely effectively. And so every other intermediary in the business has to follow Amazon in doing that very effectively. What about discoverability? It's been described in several reports and blogs uh, and so other social media comments in recent years as pretty disastrous. It's frustrating for readers. It's also frustrating for almost everyone in the supply chain. And that's at least in part because we have two completely separate metadata standards which follow books through the supply chain. The Onyx standard, which is effectively designed to meet the, uh, the needs of the retail trade with a whole load of administrative data on price, availability, where you can get uh, uh, an individual title, and so on. Uh, with subject classifications in the UK uh, through the, the BIC 
classification system, which is in, in, in essence designed to tell booksellers where to shelve their books. And then, on the other hand, you have the mark standard for, for libraries, which has no administrative data uh, of the kind that's included in uh, the Onyx um, uh, standard, and then has very uh, detailed, uh, but also to some extent competing subject classifications, so that libraries are enabled to manage their whole collections built up over several years. But none of the metadata at the moment includes detailed information uh, relating to authors or other contributors. Uh, none of them uh, includes detailed uh, information about the, the actual contents uh, of books, including chapters, sections, and so on. No information about events that have taken place since uh, the uh, publication of, of a book in the form of reviews, social media comments, uh, and so on. But how do, let's look at, in a bit more detail at how books get into libraries. For the kinds of reasons that Rick has already alluded to, libraries are under pressure. Their budgets, in particular, are under pressure, and they have perforce to spend a, a lot, to pay a lot more attention to uh, the ways in which they are meeting the strategic goals of their institutions for research, for teaching, learning, and how what they are doing meets those strategic goals. That was perhaps the case uh, only a few years ago. And that means that they've moved from building up collections just in case, so that uh, they, uh, they, they second-guessed what their uh, students and academic staff might want to have. They moved from that to more like a just-in-time kind of uh, uh, approach, getting the books that they know that their students and staff want. They move to a preference for e-books because that gives them more content um, for their money than it does uh, with print. They move to more direct linkages with uh, course reading lists, and even to allowing their academics to purchase books direct through the routes, the various routes that they set up. And there's a whole host of. Uh, new acquisition models, so-called demand-driven or patron-driven uh, patron uh, acquisitions, evidence-based acquisitions, short-term loans, approval lists, uh, and so on, many of which at least some of you will be reasonably familiar with. But again, there are differences between how books get to libraries uh, if they're print on the one hand, uh, of whether they're e-books on the other. If they're print, they come through traditional library suppliers. In the UK, there is a restricted number of suppliers uh, who have model agreements with uh, UK u universities and, new, uh, and consortia. They provide so-called shelf-ready books. And actually, libraries don't use Amazon very much because they're they don't have a model agreement with them, and there are all kinds of restrictions uh, on the use of institutional uh, credit cards or debit cards and so, and so on, which uh, can allow them to, to make use of Amazon. So for e-books, they're making uh, use of the big aggreg aggregators, EBSCO, Dawson, Baker, Taylor, and so on, using these uh, demand-driven, uh, short-term load and so on models. But of course, each of the aggregators uh, has a different platform with different features, different licenses. And because publishers release only uh, restricted uh, uh, aggregations of their, uh, of their book contents to, uh, to any of these aggregators, there's a whole host of, uh, of platforms which have overlapping 
con content. Uh, and so several libraries find themselves in, in the position of having to uh, subscribe to platforms which mean that they have some titles on two or three or more platforms alongside other titles that are only on one platform. And then they have to uh, confront uh, DRMs which have all kinds of restrictions on the ways in which content can be used. Now publishers, of course, would like uh, to make more use of direct supply to, to libraries, cutting out the aggregators, and that's why individual publishers have created packages of individual titles uh, with, through the evidence-based uh, acquisition model in, on the whole, often with no DRMs. But in all these cases, there are huge problems of discoverability, of how pricing models work, and publishers' e-commerce systems have a long way to go before they get anything like as good as Amazon. But the library preference for e-books has all kinds of implications beyond this, because it has huge implications for, uh, in terms of their revenues for both publishers uh, and suppliers and aggregators. There's a huge tension with reader preference. All the surveys show a very strong and continuing reader preference for print. The new acquisition models bring huge changes in patterns of acquisitions, and the frequent variations in the models underlying these, uh, these new forms of, of acquisition mean that no one in the industry Publishers, aggregators, um, or libraries, no one has a good understanding of what works best. More collection development is now being done by third parties rather than, than libraries, um, which some would argue is um, a, an abrogation of responsibility by libraries. But of course, there is a, a very strong upside to, to all this, that more content is being made available uh, to readers, whether they're students or staff, and also that we have the potential to gather and analyze much more data, which we couldn't do before, on usage. But we are only in the very, very early stages of building up the skills and the competences which would enable us to interpret that data and to take action resulting from such interpretations. So I'm now going to hand over to Richard, who's going to take you through the retail side of the chain.